Hello, so we're here again, but this time we're talking about uh, one of my favorite topics, and that is Lucene and open search. Um, so a bit about me, I know this is boring and you all want to talk about Lucene, I, I understand. But um, so just so you know, I'm Sam, um, I was architect of the OCI open search service. Um, I was also architect of the OCI Observability Platform. Previously, I worked at AWS, um, at EBS. Previously, I worked at startups. I actually did not have room to put all that there. It's kind of, there is a nice picture of the Golden Gate Bridge, so I didn't want to ruin it. But <laughs> in any case, um, why are we here today? And I, I first like, you know, I'm going to talk about things that I think are cool, but I feel really compelled to actually convince you that this is important. And the reason, um, the reason why it's actually important, at least to me, and I have uh, some motivation to talk about it, is um, <clears throat> that there are actually two answers to that. So the, the first answer is like, uh, you know, why is it, Im why is it important to, to deal with storage formats? So, uh, short answer is my bosses asked me to. Uh, the, the longer answer, <laughs> I think, is a bit more interesting. It's that you know we have some teams, and you know, so for example, I mentioned the our observability platform, and they actually store a lot of their logs in Parquet format, for various reasons: compatibility with Apache Spark, um, uh, compression benefits, all kind of other things, but. Then comes a question. So wait, 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 wait. What if we wanted to use some some of the good things that open search can do, and we want to use, but we want to use it with like the data, like that ton of petabytes of data that you know we accumulated for all this other stuff. So then you have uh, some of the classic answers, and you know there is data prepper, and we all love data prepper, and we can take petabytes of data and we can shove it all into open search and we'll have like a big huge black box with lots and lots of data and we talked how we do it last year uh, with you know 750 nodes and whatnot but but let's think about it for a second we have things today like you know the searchable snapshots right and searchable snapshots what's kind of nice about it is that we don't have to write the same like we can actually read something that is like in S3 or in OCI object storage and we can search on it and we can use it as if you know as if it's local and that's kind of nice because it saves us some cost and it saves us some storage so this is the long answer <laughs> and the long answer really is about compatibility um, you know, you want to make it friendly for other data warehousing solutions. And sometimes you also just want to extend functionality. So we have our friends here from, you know, Amazon, and they did amazing work with the KNN vector format where they extended to use native, native formats like things like NMSLib and Face. And those things were, you know, really, really, really helpful also in extending functionality, not just in extending, you know, making it cheaper or compatible or something like that. And stay tuned. There is a demo at the end. Um, it's all, not all going to be just about, you know, kind of super te technical thingies. It's also going to be me showing you how I get open search working with Parquet and how we actually use Apache Spark to read directly from this open search index to physically read those files. So you have something to look up for. Now with this, now with this task in mind, so let's, let's kind of circle back a little bit. So we wanted to take open search. We wanted to make it to support Parquet. And, and then we were like, okay, and I kind of jumped ahead and I talked about Lucene and all kind of things, but let's, let's forget that for a second. Let's just say we were given this problem, right? Well, why would we even want to, you know, to, to go that deep? Parquet is Parquet and Lucene is Lucene and who cares? Like, wh why can't I just take open search, plug in something somewhere and generate some Parquet? So for that answer, I want to take a couple minutes to just go over the data abstraction types that we have in open search and how we eventually drilling down to really changing format of, of the, the actual physical format that sits on the disk. So 
let's start with the first one, the mapper extension. So if you open open search code, you want to like create some plugins, then the first thing you run into is like, oh, I want to add a new field or a new data type or a new mapping. You have the mapper extension plugin. And that's actually pretty nice because when you look at open search, it has a lot of nice, you know, fields like you can have IP, date, geopoint, ranges, anything. <clears throat> now the but the interesting thing about about that one is that it doesn't really talk about, you know, how is it like actually encoded, how is it implemented. That is actually the, the mapper extension is actually using more like the primitive, uh, you know, the primitives, and it actually kind of binds them together. So that is probably not the right place. Let's go to the next. Let's peel the onion a little bit more. So what's under? So when we try to talk to open search to read or search, we you know we work in open search with documents, and that component that facilitates our access to documents is the engine, right? Now, the engine in open search, what does it do? It does things that, you know, kind of what you would imagine a database engine would do. Um, so I mentioned it facilitates reads and writes and transactions of, you know, for example, when we try to index something or commit or merges. And this is all very, very useful. However, <clears throat> the engine is completely coupled with Lucene. Like, if you open the engine, then you can see that the engine actually using Lucene constructs behind the scene. And now that's kind of confusing, right? So, okay, why, why Lucene? Why is it important? Why engine need to be, you know, Lucene is a search library. Why would an engine use that to do all those things? So the the truth is, is that I tend to think of Lucene a bit differently. Uh, for me, it's actually like a mini database library that tends to do some like really, really good search, but it actually has a lot of like built-in database functionalities. You can facilitate commits, you can facilitate two-phase commits, you can facilitate, uh, you can create indices, you can search them. Uh, there is a you know, tracking of segments and the files and all kind of stuff. And, but also it has those, you know, constructs that we use in the upstream of, you know, of the project, like documents and fields. So <clears throat> let, let's talk a bit about those constructs. So, so you know, open search has documents. But behind the scenes, it's eventually translating to a Lucene document. So Lucene document is similar, but is a little bit more, let's say, a little bit more primitive, but, but in some ways more, more involved. So a document, right, in a simple way to look at it, is a collection of fields and values. So field can be first name, value, Sam, right? And, you know, that can be, a field type can be a text or a string. In this case, you know, his first name sounds like a good string. A string can be a good field type. Um, we can say whether the field should be indexed, as in whether, you know, I can later search for it. Um, that field, and then there is, this is really confusing, stored or not stored? What, what does that even mean? Like you indexed it, doesn't that mean it's already stored? So. This is actually something we're going to touch on very soon, and also that question of doc values versus stored field. So again, what does that mean? Didn't you just index it? Should be there. But the truth is that this is actually a lot simpler than what it sounds. The terminology is just a little bit confusing, and we're going to unpack all of that in the next minutes. So the <clears throat> let, let's talk about what is a com what are the components of a Lucene field. So we talked about the properties of it, right? Like type and all that stuff. But in Lucene, and this part is actually really, really interesting, okay? So in Lucene, if I take something super simple, like say a field, first name, right? Value, Sam, right? 
then in leucine, it, this, this field is actually stored in many, many different ways. There is, it's not just stored in one way. So in how many ways can it be stored? Let's think about it. If I want to search for that, then I'm going to create a posting list and a dictionary for that field, which means I'm going to have to create a posting list and, you know, and store all the documents where that you know, field is created and have a dictionary and have you know, all kind of good things that I need to, to make that query of searching work the best it can. Um, how about if I want to do a similarity search, right? like a vector search, then, OK, this was a field, first name, and value Sam, but behind the scenes, that also means that there's going to be a vector value, right? Like a KNN vector value. And what if I also want to uh, use that field later for like groupings or faceting or all kind of analytics things? Then I'll also store it in something called doc values for which is a columnar storage. So the field and value that you see is actually stored multiple times in many different ways to make the query, it depends on the context of the query, to make it the fastest and best possible. OK, so now we mentioned that there's all those different ways to store a field and encode a field. And it can be encoded in multiple ways and multiple places at the same time. But then, the question is, how is it encoded? How is it stored? What is the format of that? Right, so that is defined by the Lucene codec. So the codec really is a class, right, that we can extend, and it says, OK, this, this field, right, will have, uh, for example, you know, KNN vector field, right? But the KNN vector can be implemented either as a Lucene native uh, KNN vector implementation, or we can leverage a, a native implementation like that to face and, and, and NMSLib, right? Those are, those are things that we can do today. So yesterday, uh, one of our esteemed community member, member uh, Michael Fru, also mentioned points, which is implemented as a, K, as a BKD tree. But what if we want to implement it as a B plus tree? We can do that, right? Just need to extend the codec to what we want it to do. <clears throat> OK, so now let's talk about that weirdness of stored versus not stored and doc values versus stored fields. So doc values is kind of a very bizarre and strange way to say columnar storage, OK? And I do not know why it was called this way, but this is what it means. And stored fields really means row format storage. And those are both nice in their own way, again, depending on the context of the query that we're trying to, you know, to send. So what is row? Just, let's just explain what does that even mean. OK, so we said the columnar storage is, an, is a simple Thing, but what does it mean? It means that if, for example, I have a certain field, then I'm going to have a file right, for that field, and all the values of that field I'm going to write in that file in the order that they are written. Row storage, that means that if I have a document, I'm going to have a file, and again, I'm describing it in a very sim simplistic way, but you can imagine it, right? Like I will have a file with every chunk of the file is just a bunch of rows, right? With all their fields and values. And each one of those is better, is good for different things. So what are these different things are? So, so we mentioned, um, let's think about search, right? Open search, let's think about search. What does search do? We search for something, and then we want to show the top K, the top three results. So for every result, I have a document ID, and then I want to pull that document ID with all the fields that describe it from the disk. So with stored fields, it's great, because I have a document ID, and then I have all the fields, right? 
that are associated with it, and I can pull them out in like one disk seek. I can pull a lot of information, and that's that's great for me. If I had, if I used columnar format, right, then I'll have to go to each field. Remember, so remember, let's imagine that each field is like in a separate file, right? Then I'll have to go and I'll have to do many disk seeks depending on w on how many fields I have. However. If, for example, I'm trying to run some analytics workload, right? Like I try to, I don't know, I have transactions and I have cost and I want to summarize, right, all the transaction. I want to calculate a sum. For that, for a single field, which is like the cost, I can just run through it and, you know, it's very disk efficient to just, you know, get only the values I need, which I only need this numerical value, and I can quickly and easily aggregate it. The other important thing is compression, right? So when we store things, like say we talked about uh, stored fields, right? So if we use stored fields, we have to employ a more generic form of compression. For that, the default is the LZ4, right, compression. And we can, we can use deflate and other things to make it even more compressed, but we have to use a kind of a generic way of compressing it. But if we use doc values and we know, hey, all the values here are going to be numeric, then we can do a lot of compression magic with you know, bit packing and uh, delta compression and a bunch of other uh, amazing ways that there are like a bunch of talk in their own, in their own right. So, <clears throat> okay. So now we kind of know what are the you know, what are the building blocks of a field? We know what describes how they're implemented, how they're encoded. Okay, but what does it mean for us? Okay, so we mentioned we want Parquet, we want Avro, we want beautiful things that all the data warehouse, data science community is using. How does that help us? So, before we get to Parquet, so uh, Avro is kind of a straightforward, we can use what will we use? Likely the stored fields. It's a row format. Parquet is something a little bit more, com more complex, so let's talk a little bit about Parquet. So Parquet is stored, right, also in a columnar fashion. Very, very similar to doc values. However, Parquet, one of the appealing things about Parquet is that it also has a functionality called row groups. What does it mean, row groups? It means that similar to how, you know, in, in Open Search and in Lucene, we can say, hey, document ID and what fields, the, you know, are associated with it. So Parquet can keep metadata about which quote-unquote rows we had. It doesn't really have a row storage format, but you know, it will tell you what other, you know, what other columns in what pointers you need to pull to, to get the full information of that row. So that makes things a little bit more complicated for us. We can fix this. I mean, we can solve it, but it's a bit more complicated. <clears throat> so we can implement it as doc values, but then if we just implement it as doc values without considering the, you know, the row context, then we're just going to lose the row group functionality, which we can do. Um, there are ways around that. We can do some caching and some ugly things, but you know, it's possible, but maybe not ideal. It's easier to do it with, um, I'm, I'm just going to skip through this slide real quick. Um, it's easier to do it with stored fields because then you get a row and you just write it to Parquet as like a row and, you know, the Parquet writer does its thing. And that actually works really well um, in generating Parquet. But then my Lucene metadata thinks that this is a stored field. It thinks these are rows. So if I have open search and open search tries to do some optimization like the one we mentioned to pull up a to pull back a search result, oh, I have a stored field here. Let me use those. And behind and actually it will do, you know, the ugly thing instead it like it used columnar format with many disk six. So that can confuse the upstream application. Um, it will work, but will not be ideal. 
<coughs> Sorry for that. OK, so there are some solutions around that. So obviously, we can do ugly hacks, and we can get both of those working. So that was done. But if you want to think forward, then we can also make some improvements in the Lucene indexing chain or other interfaces to make it easier to extend to things like Parquet. But again, the, all those things are things we can do. Um, so I mentioned ugly hacks and things we can do to get things fixed and get it working, but there are things that we actually are a lot more serious than harder to change and fix. So one of the, you know, for good and bad, Lucene and OpenSearch, they're both implemented in Java. And Java is great, and we love Java, but it creates some limitations. So one limitation, right, when we're thinking of Java, is that of uh, when we have to access code or libraries that are not Java, right? That's the first limitation. The second limitation is when we think, you know, that's common to both Lucene and Open Search, and that's something that we had to overcome on the KNN implementation. But when we think of Open Search, we think of a giant monolith of code. So Lucene is super complex, but is super compact. It has like close to no dependencies, the chances of Jarhill are pretty low. But with OpenSearch, with the plugin mechanism, Jarhill chances are pretty high. Even for like your basic hello world, you're likely to encounter a Jarhill issue. <clears throat> so what can we do? <laughs> so we mentioned two options, right? So there are two possible solutions today that can, that were discussed. So this one is actually in use, as, as I mentioned, in the KNN plugin. The KNN plugin is using JNI to extend Lucene, and by extending Lucene codec, we eventually extend OpenSearch to use um, native libraries such as Face and NMSLib. And that works. It's, you know, it's not without its cons and pros, but it works. However, what happens when you have a library that is implemented in Python or a library that is implemented in Java? You just cannot put it back to open search because of all the Jar Hill issues. That will not work for that very well. <clears throat> so the other approach that we have today in the project is extensions. And again, uh, no offense intended to the amazing work that was done on extensions. It's still experimental. It's very likely to crash, but that's OK. Everything starts like that, and we're a good community. We're going to make it better. But there are actually bigger problems than that. And the bigger problems with extensions is that it's really geared towards, OK, if I want to run, let's say, like an email notification plugin, and I want to run it on like a different node than the node that you know, is doing the indexing, then I can create an extension. It can register itself. Then the cluster does some routing magic to this node, and everything is great. But that is, not a, that is a terrible fit for um, a data plane use case where you have to write data at high throughput locally, always locally. We're not going to try to route, again, data to a different node. So that does not work for us, right, this model, because then we're going to have to, first of all, we'll have to spin extensions by a different process. Then we're going to have to figure out how we make the locality happen, how we make the routing happen. It's really complicated, and it's not working. So cannot use extensions. <clears throat> this is the approach. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen that. So this is the approach that um, eventually uh, we've taken in the POC that we created. The POC is the uh, local external writer. And I know there is a GitHub link. You can look at it, but not now. I can make it easier on you. The, the summary of it is as follows. I don't want to use a JNI because the JNI is, is really not great when I have to use it for something not native. Um, 
and I don't want to use extensions because it's not going to work. So this is sort of like trying to be like a hybrid solutions between the two things. So what does that mean? So let's say I'm the data node. And um, I have a few documents to write, and I look at the codec, and the codec, sex, the codec says, sorry, you need to write this in parquet. And I'm looking and saying, OK, parquet, that means I, need, I cannot do it within the monolith JVM. I have to spin a separate process. So it's going to spin a separate process locally. And that process is like a resource. So it's like an auto-closable resource that we're remembering you know, as part of the accounting of when we close an index or when we you know, turn, turn off like our open search instance to always close. So we don't have to have some distributed magic or some you know, crazy hash tables or anything that sort of you know, keep track of that. And, and through, uh, through RPC communication, so that can be protobuf, uh, in our case, um, there is a communication that is actually very similar. There is a protocol that is very similar to the one open search is using, uh, just for simplicity and the attempt to reduce dependencies as much as possible. Then we can just you know write whatever we need locally. We don't need to deal with uh, we don't have to deal with any monolith jar hell issues, or you know if it was Python then any Python issues. Uh, we don't have to to go through JNI back and forth to, to the JVM. So it's making it really, really easy. <clears throat> so um, I want to show you, uh, this is a recorded demo. And this one is just to show you um, how, uh, actually, you know what? I think or I'm going to have to skip this one. I'm just looking at the time. Let me show you the next one. So this demo, I'll just explain what's in there, is a demo how you can actually use uh, Lucene and how you can extend the codec and how you can make um, your own custom you know, codec that replaces either stored field formats or doc values. It's a cool demo, but I'm going to want to make some room for questions, so I'm going to skip to the next yeah. one. This is a demo oh, of Lucene. Oh, oops, sorry. This, no, OK. So the next one is going to be more interesting. You'll actually see how I used it on open search, how we eventually got open search to work with it. So again, this is the last part of the uh, Lucene storage extension demo. And in this part, you will actually see how useful are all the things that we've just seen earlier um, by that where we shown how we can replace Lucene stored field formats and other formats. So let's just take a quick look. And I promise there's also going to be open search dashboards here, not just my terminal. But let's just take a quick look and see what's actually is open up here. So this one is the external writer, uh, the external writer server. This is open search <coughs> with the uh, parquet storage plugin extension and this one is open search dashboards and you can see here I already typed this uh, terminal command to show me which indices uh, I have and you can see have I created these two indices called my normal index and my parquet index and kind of interesting to see is what those indices properties are like. So if we're going to, for example, try and see what's under my normal index, then there is nothing quite interesting. We see the schema, the mapping here is very, very basic. There is these two fields, test integer field and test text field, and both of them are stored. We have the property store set to true. We can also see here that parquet in the index setting is turned off by setting it to false. However, let's take a quick look now at the other index that says my, that's called my parquet index. And when we look at this one, the first few interesting things that we see, we see that it has exactly the same schema, exactly the same mapping as before with these two fields. And one interesting thing that it has here is that parquet is turned on to true. 
So let's just see what that exactly would mean. And actually, we can type, of course, some other terminal command lines, but I think it would be even nicer if we just looked at open search dashboard. So let me just put it here to the center of the screen. And you can see I have here these two indices. And this is my normal index, and this is my parquet index. And in fact, they look pretty much exactly the same. And that's actually pretty nice because this really allows me to use those interchangeably regardless of how my that my actual storage codec is my storage encoding is on the disk now let's take a quick look but you know again i don't think i actually shown you a proof that this is stored differently all you've seen here is just a setting flag and a ui so let's just see how else I would be able to prove it to you. So one thing I can do in order to make that a little bit more uh, clear. So let's just take a look at the indices again here. So you see my parquet index and I can take a look and see that it has this um, unique identifier. Now, one of the things that I can do here is I can actually go and I can list the the files right so remember this identifier uh, is the index i can actually list the files that are present on this test cluster so this class test cluster only has one node so this shard is all it has and you can see here as we've seen with the standalone lucene demo that it has only the PRQD file. It does not have the FDT, FDX, FDM, and all, and all those free files that correspond to stored field formats. It only has this one, this PRQD extension. And that's the same extension that we've seen in the standalone Lucene format. Now, let's see another interesting thing. So, okay, so we have a backend format with parquet and that's great but what does it give us so so there are obviously a lot of things some would argue better compression some would argue better compatibility but the compatibility one is actually more interesting here so one of the nice things about parquet is that it's very much compatible with um, modern <clears throat> like big data frameworks, for example, like, uh, like Apache Spark. So I'm going to actually launch Spark Shell right now in this terminal. And now you're going to see this is just a Spark Shell that I have just launched. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to open this PRQD file via a Spark Shell. So Spark can read Parquet file formats natively. Now, one thing in the Spark shell that is a bit of a problem, this uh, underscore at the beginning can throw it off. So I'm just going to copy it to to zero dot PRQT just to remove that um, that underscore at the very beginning. And then let's see what we can do. So now, okay, we have the Spark shell turned on. Now we can read the temp PRQD. <clears throat> So we read that parquet file. Now we can create um, a view, a temporary view of the file. We'll call that view parquet file. And then we can actually run SQL commands on it. So for example, we run SQL and let's say show. And we actually see the same values like we've seen in the open search dashboard. We can actually remove this truncate if we just say truncate false. And that's it. Now we can see not only that we were able to use the backend storage extension, but the, the storage formats extension, I'm sorry. But we also see what power it has, not only in the ability to integrate with newer modern formats, but also in its ability to, to be compatible with uh, popular big data systems. Okay. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>